Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First, welcome to the South Africa podcast. You're listening to myself, Ivan Wolf, and my co-host Scratch. And today's guest is Matthew Ebel. Uh, good day, Matthew Ebel. Hi there. Thank you for actually pronouncing my last name correctly. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming you get it like all across the spectrum, like Ebel, Ebel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, E-ball I've gotten, which is, you know, I guess it's another bad dragon toy. Um, I've gotten, no. I, it's to the point where, and I, I might want to double check this before I actually say it out loud, but I, I believe I still own MatthewEvil.com just in case somebody mishears my name as well. So I get it from both both sides there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Matthew, uh, we, we call you Matthew, Mr. Evil, Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil sounds great, actually. <laughs> It's a, it it kind of pins you as an as an old bastard who remembers what movie that was from. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Didn't spend yeah, six well. years in evil medical school. So, <laughs> uh, evil. <laughs> evil singing school. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Evil musical school. Uh, I mean, you can call me whatever you like. Uh, in the fandom, I also go by Hallie because I cannot come up with an interesting furry name. Um, Mine's a verb. So. No, uh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um so jeez, it's we it's it's been a long time coming. We've been trying to get a hold of yep. you for a while now. I know that uh really? initially it was yeah, actually. Um we'd uh, scratch how long have I been talking about possibly trying to get Matthew Ebel on here? Oh, months. How, like, how long have I been how long have I been playing um in the muck? I have no idea like Forever since, since 2001. Mm, well, we've been doing this for nearly almost three years now, so not quite that long. Yeah. Mm. September, it's three years. Wow. Yeah, damn. Goodness. Mm. So, so when, yeah, when you when you say you were trying to get me on the show, uh, what what was what exactly was keeping you? Because I literally have an email contact form on my website, and I'm literally like Ma- I'm Matthew Ebel on pretty much everything but Gmail. <laughs> like, well, I don't know uh, what was that, stopping you. Uh, let, let's put it more like this. It's it's kind of the same reason as to why it took us about the the vast majority of about a year to get Uncle Kage on here. <laughs> I was frightened. Yeah, <laughs> it's more a case of like trying to get a foot, trying to like spark off a reason to get you, as opposed to just no, like gotcha. cold calling you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's Ivan Wolf from South Africa. I'm pretty sure you've never heard of us, but. Click. Which is correct, but you know, yeah, I'm yeah. not. I mean, I'm, in the in the grand list of things that I search for on the internet on a regular basis, uh, South African-based furry webcasts uh, does not rank high among them. So, like, you know, it's not nothing against you guys. Just you can kind of see how the 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 Venn diagram of interests for just some music dude who lives in Boston, Massachusetts, in the states, probably. Not a whole lot of overlap there on a day-to-day basis. So no, I actually have not heard of the podcast before, yeah. but uh, it sounds cool. Yeah, <laughs> b- believe me, we know how niche we are. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the, the you know I I was part of that not to completely hijack your conversation, but no I was uh, I, I was uh, uh, part of the the sort of wild west of podcasting back in 2004 when it was the shiny new thing and everybody was trying to figure out what to do with it and like the. The lifeblood of podcasting is the niche, is the shit that would never make it on commercial radio or on commercial TV because, you know, you're you're not going to be serving millions upon millions of people necessarily unless your niche happens to become popular. But, mm-hmm. like, you, you can still have a successful show that serves the people who need to hear that and who have that interest, and you can do that without spending a whole lot of money to do it, you know? Like, that's, that was the beautiful thing about that whole revolution, you know, what, uh, like, 13 years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. And, and there's nothing to be ashamed about being a bit niche, you know? <laughs> yeah, fair point. Yeah, I mean, like, don't go. No, no, I'm just saying fair point, I mean... The internet gives everybody yeah. a platform, no matter how big that platform is. Mm. Oh, true. I mean, Matthew Ebel, for instance. I mean, like it's 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 interesting. Like, I mean, your your career spans over twenty years now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, professionally, almost twenty years now. Yeah. Yeah. 
And on and yeah, yeah. Almost almost 20 years as a professional, but I mean I've been taking piano lessons since I was 5 years old back in uh, uh the Stone Age. Uh, you know, before the internet. So no. that was such uh, a time. Yeah, I mean like I've, I've been a musician for much more than 20 years. Mm. But I mean, like when it when it comes to and, and I mean, we'll get to your new album uh, just now. But I mean, like how when when you started, like how exactly did you sort of get into the sort of scene? Did you do any like actual training and things like that? I know that some people are self-taught and things like that. So what what were you sort of aiming for when you decided that you want to become a musician? Uh, wow. OK, well, first of all, there's well over a decade between when I started learning my craft and when I decided I actually wanted to do it for a living. Because uh, mm-hmm. nobody makes career decisions at five years old. Um, you know, I started started taking piano lessons at age five. And uh, it wasn't until middle school, you know, about like age 12, 13. I'm not sure how that translates into South African educational blocks, but whatever. About, you know, age, age 12-ish, 13-ish. Um, uh, this was back in the early 90s. Um, I I didn't know at the time whether I wanted to continue with music because at that point I'd been doing it for uh you know like nearly nearly 10 years which at that point in my life that's a good chunk of time um and uh uh, also computer programming because uh I don't know if any of you any of the people listening to this are old enough to remember something called hypercard on the mac back when the mac was only in black and white um the tv was in color I'm not that old motherfucker um but uh uh when uh, uh, back back in the days of HyperCard, like me and my friends uh, used to make video games, you know, really terrible little video games in this somewhat slideshow, somewhat scripting program, somewhat object oriented programming thing called HyperCard, which was pretty damn cool. And I don't think it exists in any shape or form anymore. Um, but like I, I was becoming disenchanted with you know, learning Bach and Rachmaninoff and all these things that I have an appreciation for now that I'm in my 30s. But, you know, like all these, uh, all these, uh, uh, all this classical music that just did not speak to me in any way, shape or form. And like, you know, classical jazz music did nothing for me. And I wasn't really getting into uh, to, you know, any any other like piano based music that that I was being exposed to at the time. So it's like, well, I really love this programming thing. And two mm-hmm. things happened almost in the same week. Uh, first of all, a program I was working on, uh, uh, a Pogs game, and again, if you're old enough to remember that, or if that's become like a meme now or a retro thing, whatever, but they, there were these things called Pogs, look them up, they come from Hawaii, uh, they were a big fad in the early 90s, we had and, them as well. uh, among the kids anyway, sort of like the, the precursor to Pokemon, I guess. Um, this, this video game that I was working on, it like my computer locked up on me mid-save. So, and I was you know, way too young to know what backing up was. So uh, I, this thing that I've been working on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours uh, had just been turned into garbled shit on an unreadable disc. Um, and also, sorry? I said, oh, crap. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, very much so. I said many things to that effect when that happened. Um, and also in the same week, my uh, choir teacher, a guy named Sean Wright, uh, we had just finished some kind of a performance, like a school performance or something like that. And traditionally, the, the day after we've done a concert is just sort of a hangout and chill day during choir. It's basically just like, all right, nobody cause trouble and just read, play cards, do whatever you want. You know, like just don't go roaming the hallways, you know, stay in the classroom, but, you know, catch up on homework, play the piano, whatever you want to do. Uh, this particular time, Sean Wright brought out this little box, and he plugged his guitar into it through something called MIDI. Ooh. And, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. It, 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 MIDI stands for music, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And this was all news to me at the time, but it's, uh, uh, he started playing the piano on his guitar and the strings on his guitar and the gunshot and the telephone and the bird tweet and all those like standard MIDI pack sounds, the like 128 standard uh, 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 general MIDI sounds that existed at the time. And all the other kids were looking at this like, oh, that's really cool. You know, he had like a, a pitch to MIDI converter he strapped to the guitar and it was just able to to play through this this uh, boss doctor synth was the name of the module and all the other kids were just sort of like oh that's pretty cool 
And I'm sitting there with my jaw hitting the floor like, what is this thing? How can I absorb its power? Uh, and the the real, the defining moment here is I asked him, like, like I, we have a digital piano at home that I practice with, you know, because our, our upright grand is, you know, the soundboard is fucked on it and it's out of tune and all that. So my parents bought a digital piano that they never have to tune and while I'm learning stuff come out to come to find out later in life that like oh yeah when you're a parent if your kid is learning to play an instrument start with a digital piano because you can make them plug in headphones and then you don't have to hear them sucking for 20 years (laughs) anyway so we have a digital piano at home like can I take this home and plug it in and he's like sure just bring it back tomorrow for a junior high school, you know, middle school teacher to loan what at the time was like a $300 piece of equipment to just one of his students and trust that he'd bring it back in one piece. Like, that's a level of trust that, you know, I was not about to violate. And I, as soon as I got it home and I was playing drums on my piano, I'm like, I'm hooked. This is, this is a message, you know. I sort of realized that there's, a, there's, a, a, there's two ways my career path could have gone. If I was really good if I became the absolute best in my field as a video game programmer my name would briefly appear in the end credits or an opening splash screen and I would live my life in a in a windowless cube for the rest of my days or taking the other path as a musician people would be throwing their underwear at me and lining up to have sex with me maybe or at the very least buying me drinks just to hang out with me and like that's you know the the mid 90s rock star uh, 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 you know, image the the major label. You know, everyone gets their own private jet and private island, and you know, naked people jumping into their their bed at every opportunity, mm-hmm. like that that kind of image. But like that was what was going through my mind at the time. Like I'm either going to be a credit line on maybe if I'm lucky if I'm one of the lead programmers on some video game that maybe nobody will ever download or buy, or I could be touring the world and, and enjoying this kind of a life. And that's when it really just sort of clicked. So I guess junior high is when the decision was made to starve for the rest of my life. Starve. <laughs> nice. <Yes. laughs> All right. Wow. I mean, like, that's, that's a lot of information. To so 90 on. minutes later, you've answered one question. All right. That's good. <laughs> 15, actually, which is great. So we're on track here. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So... When when it comes to influences and things like that, I know that I mean it, it probably says something about that on your on your website, but maybe just uh, talk us through what what your influences are or were or how they've moved forward um, throughout the years. Like where did you where did you start and where are you now? Oh uh, geez, well see the thing is like like I started out doing contemporary Christian music, so you know boy has boy has my career path changed trajectories mm-hmm. a few times. <laughs> Um, I don't know. So, you know, like, like early on, I don't know. I, I, it's, I listened to a lot of classic rock and I don't mean eighties because at that time, like we were, we had just gotten out of the eighties. So I'm talking like late sixties, early seventies, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, the guess mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, uh, wasn't a huge Beatles fan until, you know, my musical tastes developed more honestly, mm-hmm. but you know, cause they just, they were just too weird for me. The Beatles were too weird for me. Like, this is what what kind of a stiff-ass kid I was. Um, <laughs> oh, somebody in the chat says, you guys are cutting in and out on this side. Oh, crap. I can talk closer to the microphone if that no, will make your connection no, no, better. No, 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 that's... Uh, that's, that's, I, I that's, that's normally just first stream, I think. <clears throat> All right. It's, for, it's everywhere, actually. Um, anyway. We're just, dropping, dropping in a lot yeah. of places. Ugh. Oh, yeah, we, we've dropped out again. Yeah. Well... Um, um, give me a second. Um, yeah, we're, we're dropped out on Freight Out of Him. Yeah, well, I guess I'll just stop talking and drink my tea. Give me a second. And we're back. Uh, no, and we're gone again. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Fuck. Um, let me check something. Uh, so popular, he broke he broke furry dot fm. Even though there's nobody in the chat room. Um, uh, well, there there are enough people in the chat room, but most people don't necessarily. What's the word? Chat. Talk. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, right. well, it's it's like any furry convention. There's you know there may be three and a half thousand people there, but there's only about you know uh, most of those people are hanging out in the periphery, staring at all the fursuiters. They're not actually interacting. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, we're still out. Uh, wow. Seems we're yeah, seems we're back on now. Hopefully. Yeah. We're good. Christ, I hope we're so. Good? Otherwise, yeah. this is gonna have to be a YouTube exclusive. Uh, <laughs> well. 
don't want that problem. Right. I can't really do much. You do realize you do realize you could just stream via YouTube, right? Yeah, I know. Not to diss your network, but you know. Uh, for it's 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 more the the the, the connection rather than um, anything else. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, okay. Not necessarily the provider. Gotcha. I see. Okay. Okay. I think we're okay. For yeah. Now. I mean, you'd mentioned you. I don't even remember what the question you just asked me was, but uh, or where wherever we left Influ off. Influences <laughs> the Beatles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I started started out with with classic rock music, but I was a church going kid, so I you know started off doing Christian music and uh, and you know sort of pursued that, but like it, it really it just didn't become the thing that that I wanted to do with my life. You know, I mean, for for starters, the fact that say what you want about Christian music, everybody seems to think that Christian music sucks. There are some legitimately fantastic musicians, some thought provoking songwriters. Uh, who are devout people of faith, and uh, uh, oh wow, am am I dropping out at this no, point? No, 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 it's not okay. you. It's... Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are uh, uh, there there are people who uh, are fantastic songwriters in the Christian music world. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to have any commercial success, you have to play into I mean the same the same sort of thing that they call selling out in the the mainstream music world exists in the Christian music industry and you have to go for the the flavorless milk toast uh, vanilla ice cream your love is so lovely your mercy is so merciful you know your grace is so graceful and I worship you ooh you know kind of crap lyrics and all that mm -hmm. and you have to write about the same subject for the rest of your career mm. the same thing every song every album it has to be about God, Jesus, Christ. It has to be about you know, salvation. It has to be about that every single time. What if I want to sing about robots? What if I actually want to write a song that's sexy? What if, you know, like, like being pigeonholed into one, not just one genre, but one topic, one topic for the rest of your career? Like, what artist signs up for that? You know, like how do you how do you span a career like that? Oh my God! Fair enough. Um, scratch. Uh, yeah. What can we do to fix this? Sorry. Yeah, I know. I I honestly don't. Now back to live tech support. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. No, well, Fred Ottavan is is playing with what seems to be 1920s swing. <laughs> swing. Okay. What? Yeah. Yeah, it falls back on uh, on other stuff when yeah, uh, it's when we're it's, not playing. Um Okay, maybe just uh see if you can w restart it, I think. Mm, what don't, don't. Is, that, is is it is it your internet or is it I, I think so. Yeah. Um cuz it's it's dying on both ends. Uh we can keep talking like let's yeah. let's put this up on YouTube. I think it's going to be more worth it than anything else. Mhm. Mm yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> so much for the live questions, then, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Apologies. Um, I mean, they can still... Yeah. Wait. Yep. What? Yeah. Actually, wait. Hold on. I think we're still on. Yeah, we're sort of stable for now. Right. Yeah. Stable's good. <clears throat> okay. Cool. Uh, well, firstly, we can just apologize, I guess, for, for those <laughs> for those of you who are listening. We are terribly sorry about the uh, constant dropping. It seems like, um, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you guys you... do want to ask questions, please do. Yeah. If you if you wanted to no, you have to type that because they're not going to hear you. Uh, if you if you wanted to do if you wanted to do an interview like this in the 1980s, first of all, you would have no idea who the fuck I am because. Uh, in the 1980s, you know, it, uh, well, assuming we were all the same age as we are now in the 1980s, you couldn't do this because you'd have no idea who the fuck I am. I'd have to be internationally famous for you to mm -hmm. know who the fuck I am. Uh, and for in order for that to happen, I'd have to be already signed to a major label and touring and famous enough to make it out on your local radio stations and all that. So all the problems that you're having, technologically speaking, like put that into perspective. Like we would, without the the internet that we're cursing and swearing at right now. We, you would never have this conversation at all if it wasn't for that. 
Yeah, yeah fair. fair I mean, it's the same for the 1990s, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's that's when you sort of became, I guess, furry famous would probably be the term. <laughs> I don't think that happened until the early 2000s, honestly. I think I I, I didn't go to any conventions until 2000. Oh, actually. I mean, it's 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 not necessarily about that. I mean, again, like in 1991, I think it was 1991, wasn't it, that that you released in the muck? Which no, 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 that'd be, that'd be 2001. 2001. Okay. 2001, because that was. Uh, uh, that was when I uh, did my first album recording in a uh, uh, an actual recording studio mm-hmm. uh, for my second album, a, a Christian album at the time, and uh, we had a little time left over, so I did a couple of uh, a couple of tunes. One called "Prayer for Danny," which I did not have the balls to release uh, on an album at the time, and I probably should have. Um, and then uh, "In the Muck," which I, I had been kicking around. I had I had versions of that that I had recorded previously, but I don't think I released any of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that album, you know, that I, I brought, I think it was Anthrocon 2001 that I brought some, like, hand-pressed, hand-labeled little two-song demo CDs to the artist alley there and was just, you know, I brought, like, a CD player that I had plugged into the wall and let people just hear it and they were walking, as they were walking by, and that just had in the muck plan constantly, and that really that got to people. Yeah, you know? and it helps that like the guy, the guy that was drumming on that album, like it's a it's a swing tune. If you haven't heard it, uh, it's, yeah. it's a sw- it's a swing tune. So the the guy that I went to college with, a guy named Brian Swenland, who is a a, a fantabulous uh, jazz drummer. You know, this is when I was going to a college. It was known for instrumental jazz and uh, uh, opera. So like the 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 jazz performers that I was able to hook up with at that school were just mind blowingly good. So he he laid down some some seriously good drumming on what what was basically a mediocre album and then two singles that would have, would haunt me for the rest of my life. <laughs> is is it really just haunt, is it haunting you? Is is, is that how bad that is? <laughs> well, okay, let me put it to you this way: the song is called "In the Muck." First of all, most people don't even know what, what the fuck a muck is anymore. Second, all of the places and references the, the the places I name and the references I make in the song they're all gone now. You know, they're Not I don't necessarily. know necessarily. I don't uh, know if any of it still exists. exists. Well, okay, the west corner of the park is, you know, like yeah. it, it, it's like the the AOL front page, but whatever. Uh, it's, you know, like it, like pretty much everything else in the song, like uh, does just does not exist. <laughs> well, uh, they they all exist as rooms still within within the muck. Um, I've actually been to at least three of those, but half of them are gone. Yeah, you're yeah. more you're more right there. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, and the thing is, is that like, it was, it was actually one of, it was particularly that song that I was sitting there going, like, I actually really like this. Your voice was a lot higher pitched back then. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That one, that pitch. Um, and I don't know, like, I, I love the song personally. It's, it's one of the reasons why it is normally played (laughs) at the beginning of every, um, one of our music, uh, streams. Nice. Uh, and I don't know, like it's it's one of the things that like I guess, cat. <laughs> oh boy, get fucked. <laughs> she would love to, but I, I know. Go out of the house. I know that sound. <laughs> uh, we are professional as fuck today. Oh yes. <laughs> I, she she's professional. Uh huh. She's a professional slut at this point. Uh-huh. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. <laughs> anyway, so we were we were talking about that. So I mean, like with the, that was that was your first sort of album that you actually got, sort of came up with, or um, like, well, I, to, so? I did I did a Christian album in 1999 that was self recorded that uh, will never see the light of day. I made a thousand of them. I got rid of a thousand of them. And if you are unlucky enough to find one of those round pieces of plastic, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> the one that I went into the studio for in 2001, which is filling the pages, was better. But mm-hmm. I'm, I do not, you know, I still have many copies of that one. I only had like a thousand of those made. But like I, you know, almost immediately after making that album, I decided like, you know, I really don't want to be in the Christian music business. And this is not really good songwriting. Um, so like, <laughs> I don't know, like the, the those two songs were sort of what got my name around in the uh, in the furry fandom, at first, people had you know heard of me a little bit. I had done some you know some of the like the masquerade or talent show things at you know Anthrocon or Conifer mm-hmm. for 
anybody in the northwestern United States that remembers that one. Um, uh, we we honestly need more of your music, says M Mind in the uh, or Mind in the uh, the chat room. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like I I didn't. Shortly after moving to Nashville, Tennessee, in mm-hmm. like 2002, you know, just fresh out of college, uh, moving to Nashville, Tennessee, um, I kind of realized that like the Christian music biz wasn't for me. And then it took me until 2005 to figure out what the hell my sound was, like without just like copying the the sounds of other like Christian bands and stuff like that. And you know, it, I'm it, I still haven't really figured out what exactly my sound is. It's hard to put your finger on your own sound, but Mm-hmm. Um, like I didn't really have, you could almost consider beer and coffee to be my debut album. Cause it was, you know, my first piano rock album. The first one where I actually, you know, took risks, took chances with my songwriting, you know? Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean like it was, yeah, it took, uh, it took a while to actually get out there. And then, um, uh, that was some of the songs like that was when I started playing, uh, like like booking a panel room and just setting up a keyboard and an amp and playing for people in a panel room at, at conventions. Mm-hmm. And that was like 20, yeah, about 2005, 2006, maybe 2007. Um, and then I was playing at MFM when it was in Memphis, Tennessee, because that was the local con at the time. And the mm-hmm. folks from FWA popped into my little panel room and said, oh my, oh my God, we, we need to book this kid at FWA. And they... They booked me at FWA. They put me up in a hotel room and and you know paid for my my driving expenses or whatnot to get down there. And I played for like twelve people. Uh, they put me on the main stage and I played for like twelve people because nobody knew who the hell I was, mm-hmm. you know. So it was, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it it it's not really like anything just sort of clicked overnight. It's one of those things where you just have to sort of it just sort of built. Over the years, yeah. they made me. They made me and Lizard Beth the the guest of honor the the next year, 2008. Uh, or no, sorry, uh, 2009. It was 2009. So that was you know the the first time I'd ever been guest of honor at a, a furry convention, and like you know there, I, I played for 50 people that year. So <laughs> like, like it was, it, it it just sort of gradually built up and built up. You know, just sort of yeah. a just you just have to keep coming back and and more people tell more people it's it's a very organic thing i wouldn't say anything was like that was the album that broke me you know what i mean like nothing really really clicked overnight it just sort of people just say they like my music and then they tell a friend and somehow or another i'm able to parlay that into three meals a day you know <laughs> that's the dream though I, well, I mean like it yeah three meals a day place to stay and i don't know coffee lots of coffee, coffee. Definitely yeah. coffee. Nothing wrong with that. Or tea in your case. Well, today, tea. Yeah. I mean, I'd be drinking a beer right now if we weren't getting back on the motorcycles after this interview's over. Ah, uh, okay. We're not, we're not riding anywhere fancy. Uh, uh, my boyfriend and I, uh, who is a lion, by the way, um, uh, but we're not riding anywhere fancy because we put 230 miles, which I think is something like 10,000 kilometers, whatever. I don't know what the conversion is, but um, do 230 miles on the bikes yesterday in seven and a half hours of actual riding. So we're we're kind of done with riding for the weekend, but we need to gas the bikes up. All right, Perfect. 370 kilometers. All right, fine. Ruin that's, my fantasy. Um, that's still a little long way. That's I, that's <laughs> pretty much between what? That's that's Pretoria to Bloemfontein almost. Yeah, for me that's about from here to George. Huh. Both of them across the province. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we I was basically what we did is we drove across uh, uh, Massachusetts on the uh, motorcycles, which is like it's 90 minutes at 70 miles an hour, which I think is maybe like 110, 120 kilometers an hour, something like that. Um, 70, so about that. Yeah, right yeah, about, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that one I actually know the conversion for because uh, I've, I've driven in Canada. Um, so <laughs> the... <laughs> The uh, um, and I watch MotoGP, which is which is you know fucking great, especially if you're you know a gay boy into the uh, uh, the the biker leather gear stuff, you know the one piece racing suits. It's really rather wonderful. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, like with with I guess sort of mentioning all those kinds of things. Like when it came to I guess your initial 
uh, what would you call it, uh, beliefs moving into becoming or like being part of the furry fandom and then like releasing an album like In The Muck or with uh, with songs like In The Muck. Like how exactly did that sort of conversion happen? <laughs> what do you mean? Going going from the Christian music boy to uh, uh, tail wearing uh, uh, furry with a boyfriend? Yep. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, like most things, I, I you know, uh, I learned, oh, sorry, like most people, actually, and yeah, like most things, uh, I learned the ways of my parents and my family growing up and then left my parents and family and went out into the real world and discovered the things that were, that I was taught that were true and discovered the things that I were taught that were not entirely true and discovered things that were uh, misconceptions to begin with. You know, like, in, no, no real malice involved on the part of my parents. I don't want to give that impression, but it, like, it, like with all things, you, you learn, you learn certain things, especially you know, like in college, university, whatever you call it there. But you, you learn certain things, and then you go out into the real world and realize that, on paper, yeah, those certain things are a certain way. But boy, nothing ever works as they do on paper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, the more I experienced, uh. uh life and the more that I made friends with people and the more that I uh, the more I interacted with the people especially people who were not of my race people who were not of my religion um, you know the the more experience I got with people who were not like me and seeing the good in people and things and ways that were not like me which to me is a Christian value like I still mm. consider myself a Christian I don't I don't think that you know being <laughs> Being a furry with a boyfriend is a, uh, and being a Christian are mutually exclusive. But it was just like once, just like, you know, becoming more popular in a genre, it, it's one step at a time. You, be, you, yeah. you learn, you know, you, you shatter one illusion that you had had and move on, or you confirm something that you had learned and move on, you know, one way or the other, and just one mm. step at a time. Mm. So, so yeah, hope that okay. helps. No, that that definitely does, um, and I I guess that's that's probably for a lot of people who are, I guess, struggling uh, in essence to come to terms with, you know, feelings and things that they have and and issues that they have. Um, well, I mean, if, you, if you're if you're talking yeah. about if you're talking about sexuality in particular, uh, mm -hmm. that's something I struggled with a lot, especially as a Christian. Fortunately, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, which is a very laid back and groovy, come as you are kind of environment. Um, even though I grew up in a, a Lutheran, you know, a, a Christian Protestant household. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, I struggled with that a lot, especially once I was on my own in the Bible Belt in Nashville, Tennessee. Ooh. And yeah, exactly. Not like, necessarily a bad place to be for music, though. No, no, no. Oh, you're fucking fantastic for music. Are you kidding me? The, the people that I could just like call up on the phone and get to play on some of my demos there are just ridiculously talented people. You know, people people with the talent of uh, my current drummer Runt, uh, just everywhere, and like he's he's a diamond in the rough up here in the Boston area. Like it's difficult to find players like that up here, but like there's so many people with that level of talent in Nashville. Yeah. But it's it's also a very southern, very you know like orthodox so. uh, Baptist kind of Christian environment. So um, as far as coming to terms with my sexuality. I kept, and this is me just preaching a little bit here, I kept uh, asking, you know, like, I kept, I kept praying, asking God, like, looking in the Bible, like, asking, like, is there something wrong with me? Am I doing something wrong? Is this a sin? Is this something I can live with? Like, what is this? And I kept getting the same answer from him. And, uh, like, I, I swear to God, I actually heard this answer audibly at least once. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 he, all I ever got, you know, like, looking at passages in the Bible was, I love you. And like, well, okay, that's nice, but am I doing something wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Is this a sin? And I love you. I love you. I love you. And I, it eventually wore me down to the point where I realized I'm asking the wrong question. It shouldn't fucking matter what yeah. I think about this, and it shouldn't fucking matter what other people think of this. The entire point of the gospel, if you've ever read the Bible, if you've ever believed in it, the, the entire point of the gospel is that for God so loved the world that he basically you know, suffered and died himself so that we wouldn't have to stress about being perfect. And what is important is, he loves me. Stop focusing on yourself, Matt. 
start focusing on the shit that he that that he was teaching in the Bible. Be good to others, you know. Uh, be charitable. Help the sick. Help the needy. Help the people that don't like you. You know, focus on that. Why are you focusing so much on yourself and your sexuality when you could just be out there doing my work? That's kind of the impression that I got, and I realized, okay, I really don't need to worry about this. That's, you know, it wasn't so much a justification or some kind of like legal, like, aha, here it is in this verse, in this chapter, in this translation. It was just a realization of I'm doing exactly what Satan says, what, what, what Satan wants you to do in everything that you read about Satan in the Bible, which is focus on yourself. And as soon as I stopped doing that, it, it made my life a whole lot easier. And I'll stop just preaching here. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's actually uh, well, uh, there's there's a word that I was going to come up with uh, and and I've forgotten now. Um, refreshing is, is oh. the term I'd like well, to that works. Say, I'd like to say like it is it is definitely a refreshing point of view. I mean like we, um, I mean we're not necessarily like myself. I'm not necessarily the most believing of people when it comes to that, especially when it comes to what's the word. Uh, formalized religion but i mean like hearing something like that is actually pretty cool like just that kind of perspective from somebody that 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 makes a lot more sense to me than to what other people preach <laughs> yeah nothing and nothing i like is, i like that better. nothing um, is ever crystal clear you know so where was i i i scratch no we were yeah <laughs> the lead-up question was like how did you go from you know, Christian music yeah. to Christian. here. Yeah. Gradually. <laughs> gradually. No, that, that works, I guess. Yeah. Short just answer, edit. gradually. You could, you could edit this all out later, just like bring it down <laughs> to that one question, and everything I've said for the last 20 minutes now is just going to be <clears throat> shit canned. All right. Uh, oh, well, mine says amen. He actually has a question. Uh, oh, I that, see that. that. Yeah. He's asking, um, what was your most popular song, both furry-orientated as well as non-furry-orientated? Okay, well, first of all, orientated is not a word. Um, I, I did this to you in Skype before we actually went online here, by the way. Like, it, it, is, it is if you say it orientated. Oh, Jesus. No, it's not. It's oriented. Oriented. You're not conversating. But, you're conversing. Uh, you're... Oh, fuck it. But, uh, language... <laughs> uh, this is the reason why I don't give a. This is the reason why I don't give a crap about like things like this. As an English lecturer, language is supposed to be malleable. It's supposed to be um, <clears throat> changed when and where people can do it. Yes, the rules exist. Yes, they're there. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to, or that you don't, or can't come up with a word like orientated. Yeah, but see, the, you come to up me... with the word orientation, which kind of leads towards the term orientated. Yeah. Some people use the word orientated. But the th- the thing is, like to me, that's a step backwards. Like language, language to me, this and th- this is this is probably because I'm a lyricist, uh, and you know, I I have had to. It also means, unfortunately, I'm a poet. Um, I'm also a poet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like like it's. It, one of, one of the things that I learned, you know, and I, t- I took classes in poetry in high school and college, you know, trying to become a better writer. Um, and one of the things that uh, I was taught and one of the things that I, I think is, is beautiful is that poetry is sort of the art of condensing as much meaning into as few words and syllables as possible, you know, like, which you would never guess from how much I, how I fucking talk. But uh, like be condensing... Condensing is as much meaning into as little space as possible, an economy of words. And when you take a, a, a word, a functional word like orient, and make it longer, unnecessarily longer, by saying orientate, like to me that's like it's it's like it's like adding weight to a vehicle when you don't have to. You know, just like adding ballast to a vehicle. Like, okay, now you've made it less efficient and therefore it is less beautiful to me. That's my problem. I understand that it 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 becomes it becomes the lexicon. <laughs> We're poor. I'm sorry to bust on poor M mind here, but <laughs> the like it, it 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 just becomes one of those things that like uh, uh, you know like uh, the, the 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 lexicon uh, uh, that we use is at its core it is basically just a firewire cable or a USB cable transferring thoughts from one person's mind to another. That's what language at its essence. Yeah. 
is, even if you're doing it in grunts and gestures or in French or in ancient Greek or whatever. It's literally just the protocol that you use to transfer data from one computer to another. And mm -hmm. sure, if you're using an OS update that involves orientate, fine, whatever. But, you know, it's like, to, it, it's that lack of efficiency that bugs me, you know. You don't want to have to install drivers. I'm, not, I'm since, never going to answer since, this question since, either. Since when was since when was language efficient? It's never been efficient. No, it, it hasn't. It, it it isn't efficient, and that's There's, one of the Saussure things. Saussure that... speaks about this the entire time when he speaks about like and and I I, I because I I teach lingui uh, linguist stuff. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. I mean, like he, he literally says that if and it and again, it's it's what I tell my students all the time is is that write your ideas down. If I can understand what's going on here, irrespective of spelling, then that's great. If I don't understand what's going on here, then you've got a problem. Yeah, um, it's it's up to me to to sort of translate in my head what you're trying to tell me. And if what you're trying to tell me makes sense, then that gets marks. Yeah, yeah. But like you can you can read very specific, very precise a very efficient language uh, in you know, a, a scientific document and not know what the fuck it is you're reading. And then you can see something on a license plate that's spelled out with no consonants, or sorry, with, with no vowels and no punctuation and understand yep. exactly what it says. Like, I, yeah, believe me, I get that. It's just like, it's just one of my little pet peeves. It's like, oh, you're, you're adding weight unnecessarily to the language, you know. You're making me trip over another syllable when I talk, talk to you. Yeah, well, um, if it wasn't if it wasn't for language and its its ability, we'd still be saying the and thou. Oh, jeez, the uh, uh, the I, I should probably mention by the way that now that I have completely lost any chance of M Mind becoming a fan, I should answer their question. Um, mm -hmm. The <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. I don't give a shit about this blowhard and his music anymore. Um, <laughs> so, let's see, what was your most popular song you made? Furry oriented and uh, non fur. Uh, furry obviously would be in the muck. Uh, well, actually, it is a toss-up still to this day between those first two songs that I put out as a single, basically. Um, uh, that and Prayer for Danny, which I based on a porno. Um, but it's a porno with a very good message. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, Associated Student Bodies comic that was out uh, right. in the late 90s. Oh, and yes. Early I 2000s. Really it's the first time that I'd ever seen a gay comic where the Christian was not the bad guy. And that, that more than anything else, spoke to me. It was an Episcopalian minister that, was, that actually like, helped, helped Daniel like, you know, keep his shit together you mm. know, through a very difficult time. And that really spoke to me. And that's what made me write that song. Eventually, I did tell my parents about where this story came from and just told them, like, don't ever read the comic, but this is where it comes from. Uh, because they actually like the story as well, um, or they, they like the, the song as well. But it's a toss-up between that and In the Muck. And I get a lot of requests for Prayer for Danny because, you know, In the Muck is fun to listen to and all that. And it's, it was, for those of us that spent, you know, four hours a day on a muck, it was, mm -hmm. it, was it, it was relevant. But, you know, people, religious people, Christian kids going through puberty or you know young adulthood and coming to terms with their sexuality like boy is that something that a lot of people are you know can can identify with and it's obviously something i had to uh, to uh, contend with as well and i think that speaks to people so i get a lot of requests for that one to this day um as far as non-furry oriented song uh just judging from my stats on spotify and pandora uh probably everybody needs a robot um, which is which is a song that I mind pooped out onto a <laughs> sheet of paper in a hurry because I needed to fill space on an album. I swear oh. to God, that is where it came from. I'm like, I got three and a half minutes I need to fill, and I have no idea what to do here. And this is the material that's on screen. This is for an album called Goodbye Planet Earth that, if you didn't know, synchronizes with the 2005 Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie. Oh, nice. um, cool. Yeah, so go rent that one and buy the album and sync it up. Um, and I needed something to go into that space, and it's right when they meet Marvin, the uh, the clinically depressed robot. Uh, huh. I thought I thought it was like you were looking to full space in your room, but just bumped up into your leg, and you were like, huh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. It was more more along the lines of like, okay, I have a song that goes with this section of the movie, a song that goes with this section of the movie. There's a span of about three and a half minutes or four minutes in between, and I need something to go in there, and I have no ideas right now. <laughs> and then that came in, and it is literally the most popular song uh, of any that and everybody needs a ninja, which is its counterpart on there as well uh, on the same album. About that. Um, so I don't know. Like you, you may have heard one or more of those uh, uh, online before, but like that's that's the the thing that uh, clearly. I mean, judging this is empirical data. This isn't just like people getting you know requesting things. This is actually looking at my stats on every known service that'll give me stats as an artist. Like, yep, for some reason, this thing I spit out in 2007 is still the most popular song week after week after week. Hmm. This is jaunty. Yeah. It is. Well, it's fun. It's lighthearted. Mm-hmm. It involves a Dick Cheney reference. Really? I forgot. Yeah. That. I never What? what? <laughs> you're going to have to look at the uh, you're going to have to look at the uh, the lyrics again, I guess, but yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, right, 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 right. I I I remember now. I remember now. There you go. Mm. So, um, now obviously a year ago, and I mean it's it's on here on on your YouTube site, this uh, live at Fortran Prison. <laughs> um, what exactly does what what happened there actually? Because I was always thinking, is this a prison? This isn't a prison. What, what? like a lot of the time, like I I kind of sit here going like, what what was the sort of thought pattern behind this? <laughs> Well, I mean, for the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, more theatrical shows. I experimented with doing not just concerts, but like between the songs, I would be talking to robots or animated villains or something like that. You know, actually have, trying to have like a plot going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we did two shows to that effect. Uh, uh, two, year, two or three years ago, it was called The Copper Revolution, which was a steampunk themed show. My, my robots and, and my crew and I got sucked into a vortex and landed on a, a parallel Earth you know, parallel dimension Earth uh, uh, that was, you know, steampunk themed. Uh, and we had the, the, the 90 minutes of concert was us trying to get our ship fixed and get off the planet before the local evil overlord came to destroy us. Um, and I followed that up with uh, Live at Fortran Prison, which was, uh, it's, it's a Johnny Cash reference if you're not familiar with Live at Folsom Prison, which was mm-hmm. probably his best known uh, album. Yep. Um, you didn't know that at all, did you? It's literally Cash's most well-known album, and you had no idea. All right, I listened fine. to metal. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but everybody should. You know what? He covered Trent Reznor, so you know you should fucking know Johnny Cash by now. Yeah, um, no, I know Johnny Cash. I just didn't know right. that album. All right, all right. Educate yourself. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's yeah. the that's the overarching theme of my life from day one. Throughout the religious stuff, throughout you know self-discovery and all that, is is, is critical thinking. Educate yourself. Never assume that you know everything. Never get comfortable, even if you know you don't know everything. Stretch yourself some more, uh, because you know God knows I've I've gotten into enough genres and dabbled in playing enough genres that, and it's made me a better musician and I think a better person because I've always been trying to explore more things. So, mm-hmm. sorry for okay. that. More preaching there, but um, uh, uh, the the. Fortran prison thing was we, my crew and I woke up in an alien prison and we had no idea why. It was run by an evil robot warden who was malfunctioning and making us do stuff in the middle of the concert, like play the same song eight times and faster each time, you know, or uh, 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 forcing us to bring people up on stage and make them play along with us, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's, 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 basically just a gimmick I used to have fun on stage because, you know, that's really what I'm there for. Um, mm-hmm. But it, we, we were not playing at a prison unless you consider Anthrocon a prison, uh, which some do. <sighs> Give take. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it depends on where you're coming from with that one, but, you know, like we, unless you consider Anthrocon a prison. Uh, uh, we, the, the, you can actually watch the entire concert on my YouTube page. I, I, I uploaded it one song at a time, and you can yep. watch the entire performance start to finish uh, as a playlist. Just one song one song and one, you know, sketch at a time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, like, your, your ballads, I've been listening to them more often than, than anything, and I don't know, I was 
I don't know what it is about them, but like they're really, really good from what I could like sort of tell most of the time. I try to pick them out, see like, oh wait, this this seems like a title that I need to listen to, and then I I listen to it and practically start kind of where where's where do you sort of get to like where is your inspiration? How do you actually get to write things down aside from apparently, you know, crapping them out onto a piece of paper with like <laughs> Like what? Where where do you start with your composition? Like, what's your main go to? Well, see, that's the thing. Everywhere. Uh huh. <laughs> I always hated that question because, like, literally, it 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 comes from everywhere. Uh, mm. it, sometimes it's a turn of phrase, something that I'd like to use, and then I'll build the rest of the lyrics around. Sometimes it's uh, a beat that I'll get in my head, you know, or I'll mm. be. I tend to walk around beatboxing a lot. I used to get in trouble for this as a kid because I'd be doing it in class, just sitting in the back, just, you know, and not even, like, know that I'm doing that, you know, in, like, like eighth grade, you know, <laughs> not understanding how that could be disruptive. Some um, people warm up before they do that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, right. But, like, like, like I, I would... <laughs> I, I I'd sit there in the in the in the back of classes doing that like like so if I get a beat in my head it's usually something that I'll just sit around just walking around doing that with my mouth and then oh. realize like you know I should turn this into a beat for some piece of music and you know, try and turn turn this affliction into something that'll pay my rent um, <laughs> sometimes it's a bass line sometimes it's a melody um, like with a cautionary tale I had. It, it came from two different places at once. The that the the riff the da 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 was in my head as I was driving to my day job for weeks, and uh -huh. on top of that, all I could hear was you know here's a cautionary tale, and nothing else. Like for some reason, that seemed just like a really great way to start a song out, and. I just sort of wrote something to go along with those two things. Basically using that as a jumping off point and saying, let's see where this song wants to go. Uh -huh. And I, I won't lie and say like, well, then, then the song wrote itself. Like, that's bullshit. But, uh, you know, like, like it, it, that's where yeah. a song comes from. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's lyrical, sometimes it's rhythmic, sometimes it's a melody. I never know. And the the trick is not like having something that you want to start with. It's knowing, uh, ask a photographer, you know, like, how do you take such good shots? Well, I see something that, you know, I know if I shoot it this way, will look fantastic in, in the camera. Like they, you know, sometimes they can set something up from scratch and make it happen. But nine times out of 10, it's, I saw this and it looked right and I knew how to shoot it, how, how to execute that initial idea. Mm. Oh, yeah. you know? a, a lot of and, stand up comedians. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say familiarity with the camera, familiarity with light, familiarity with uh, development or with uh, you know, digital procedures, however it's going to come out. Like, you know, like all of that makes you better able, you know, the, the, the classical training, as it were. Uh, uh, the formal training makes you better able to spot what's going to come out well or not. But mm. you, you still, you know, most of the, the skill in the, the creation, I guess, is, or most of, the, most of the work in the creation is knowing what to latch on to and work with and knowing what to shit can, you know. I've started plenty of yeah. songs that, like, I was really gung-ho about, like, I really want to work this phrase into a song, and I just, it just became it became work and it didn't really want to go anywhere and I didn't like where it was going. And so I'll set it aside. And yeah. sometimes I forget about it forever. Mm. Yeah. Fair point. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it does. Oh, okay. Hey, he found the song. <laughs> wow. Up uploaded in 2010. It's oh yeah. That was at FAU oh. when I had enormous hair. I can see that. <laughs> When, when did the afro come back into this time? It comes and goes. <laughs> I've tried big <laughs> hair over the years, but it, like I just don't look good with big hair. Ditto. Oh. I, I, looked, I looked great with dreadlocks. I missed that, but, you know. Scratch. Yeah. Like, yeah. Your, your hair becomes... You, you become a mushroom. I know. 
I have this. Especially, especially it, with your beard. It's not even oh, really so do I. a Jufro. It's something like gravity defying. <laughs> well, if you let it go for, uh, at least with with my hair, if you let it go for like literally two years, maybe it'll start to fall. Otherwise, it just looks like a shrub. Yeah. That's stuck yeah. on my head. And usually, like you said, like mushroom, it, it sort of grows out more on the sides than it does on top because, you know, biology sucks. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know, it's it's just the, the way it worked. Yep. Same uh, here. So, yo, I mean, like the thing is, is that, I mean, I, I love your sort of talking about the way that you... I guess, progress through your music, much like it seems like you progress through your life. Um, it's always a learning process and things like that. And I guess for yeah. anybody who's who's considering to be, you know, a singer songwriter or anything like that, what exactly, wh what kind of tips would you be able to give in respect to that? Um, to quote, I believe it was Pablo Picasso, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Mm -hmm. um, but now, that's literature there, as well. There, that's everything. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm. A holding, oh, that's literally everything. You know, I'm, in my hand, I'm holding a book that says "Steel." That's called "Steel Like an Artist" by Austin Kleon. Oh, um, uh, Kleon. Yeah, I have that book on my coffee table. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's a fantastic. It, yeah. Fantastic little book. It's it's just a little coffee table book. It's in you know the the print. It has I think on average like ten words per page. Like it's this. It's it's more of a visual book, more of an inspirational book than yeah. uh, a textbook. I mean, even but the yeah, sort of the, the same. Even like yeah. chapter structure is just like. It's written on the back of the book. It's like, steal like an artist. Don't wait until you know who you are to get started. Write the book you want to read. Yeah. Use your hands. Shit like that. Like, I'm reading off the back cover now. What, what I do when I, when I give, you know, songwriting 101 panels at conventions uh, is I, I tell people what, what usually works for me is, the, if, if nothing more than as a learning exercise for production, for songwriting, for arranging um, uh, is to try and copy outright something that I've heard that I liked. Um, my, my new album, Cognitive Dissonance, was very much a study in uh, Foo Fighters. Ah. You know, like I've, I've gotten very heavy into the Ben Folds kind of sound over the years, but I really, really like a lot of the just super clean, in-your-face arrangements and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, and sounds that Dave Grawl and Foo Fighters are able to come up with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and it's, it's uh, uh, one of those things where I'm not, you know, you can, you can probably hear some spots, especially in Cognitive Dissonance, uh, 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 which you can pre-order right now at MatthewEbel.com. Sorry. Um, it, some of the things in Cognitive Dissonance, like I, I'm, you can hear I'm outright like, okay, I want to try... Uh, uh, capturing Dave Grawl's, uh, the way he plays that big old Gretsch guitar through a Vox AC-30 amp, you know, like, and I'll base an entire song around just trying to work that into a song. Hmm. Oftentimes, it just becomes something that goes nowhere, or I'll, I'll send it out to my Patreon subscribers, and it will never make it to an album, you know, something like that. It's, it's more like a, uh, a case study, you know, like an artist hmm. just drawing their hand over and over again, you know, and, and working on different things. Um, sometimes it actually goes somewhere wonderful, but the fact of the matter is I'm trying to copy someone else. Mm. And unless you are an, an expert counterfeiter, anytime you try and copy someone else, you're going to throw your own flavor into it. Yeah. yeah. And what I tell people is try and copy or try and combine two different styles or techniques or something like try and combine uh, uh, Dave Grawl's guitar playing with Ben Folds' chord structures. Boom, uh -huh. go. And you're going to come up with something that is unlike any of those two. It's not plagiarism. And the way that you combine them, the way that your brain decides, okay, this is what the marriage of these two would be, is uniquely you. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So it's a way to learn techniques from other people you know, and in doing so, I, you have to do some research sometimes. Like, okay, how is he getting that guitar tone? Oh, okay, you're rolling off this, you know, at, at like 8,000 hertz and rolling off everything below 200 hertz and peaking here and, and carving it down there. You're placing the mic here in front of the amp, that kind of thing. You, you learn some technique in the process, but you're also learning, uh, uh, you know, how your brain interprets these things that inspire you. 
Mm. And and it's it's sort of a, a, a an, an an exercise in mimicking and an exercise in uh, self exploration as well. I like that. Yeah. I. <laughs> wow. And he's speechless. Fan fucking tastic. All right. This You're is fucking welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. M-Mind is asking something in the chat room here. Do you still actively attend fur cons? Well, I've just... Uh, I've, I've already played two or three cons this year. Uh, I've got a show at Anthrocon on uh, Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, this year, uh, you know, the, the beginning of July, and I am playing at uh, FA United in August, and I'll be playing at FursonaCon in Virginia in October, and we're trying to book more. Short answer, yes. So... Yeah, short short answer is very yes. <laughs> Would you if 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 our convention, uh, the South Africa convention, becomes something of a more regular thing? Would you consider coming our way? Absolutely. Are you? I'm I'm with Henry Rollins on this. Like, if there's a stage and you want me there, I will I will make it there. Like that that sounds fantastic. Now I can't go broke doing that, obviously. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Although, I, I will say this for you, for you who appear to be into bikes. South Africa is yeah. quite a nice country to be, to like, drive around on the back of a bike. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, well, it, it sounds like fun. Especially the, the bike that I've got is called the Kawasaki Versus, which is very much, um, like, like I'm, I'm part of the, the Versus owners group on Facebook, uh, and there's... Uh, there, there's a few of us here in the States that own them. You know, it's not a very popular bike here in the States, but all the photos I'm seeing are like from South Africa, from Malaysia, from Thailand, basically anywhere where there's uh, uh, crowded streets and also great off-road, you know, uh, streets. It's, it's designed to be part street bike, part adventure bike. And it, it's, and a lot of the photos actually come from South Africa. So I might actually see a lot of, a lot of people that have my bike down there. You know, yeah, yeah that's right. a good. Yeah, so that's 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 good news, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll need to figure. Well, we'll need to figure out a way to get you down here then. Well, yeah, that's the that's the tricky part because, like, I you know, I'm not, I can't, I can't drop you know the the you know thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars, whatever it's going to cost to get me across the ocean to just go to do a furry convention. You know, mm -hmm. like that's that's the the only reason that I haven't done, you know, like Euroference and Confuzzled and other other uh, international uh, uh, conventions. God knows I want to, because they There's... look like an awful lot of fun. You think I don't want to go to Germany and drink their beer and play a furry convention? Come on, you know? <laughs> yeah, hmm. that's... No, I understand that completely. That's the and dream. In fact, like, one of... yeah, go, Scratch. No, no that's the thing. That's, that's the dream. Like, German mm -hmm. beer, furry mm -hmm. con, all of that. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Uncle Uncle Kage, if I'm not mistaken, um, every now and again, if they really want to get in there, they either hold some sort of, what is it? Uh, uh, not necessarily, is it Patreon? Patreon wouldn't necessarily so like be Like GoFundMe or whatever? Yeah, go, GoFundMe's yeah. and things like that. So, I mean, there's always that option. Like, if we really want to have, like, uh, an international guest to come through, yeah. and I've, they're well known. I've told conventions that... Uh, uh, that I I won't do that kind of fundraising for uh, like for myself to get me to a convention because first of all you see too many furries doing that anyway mm -hmm. um, you know I can't afford rent but here's a GoFundMe to get me to Anthrocon like fuck you <laughs> um, <laughs> yep but the, the the other thing is that like you you're you know, as as a musician and somebody who's basically running his own business, you can only ask your your fans, your customers, for so much, and yeah. I have to reserve that for funding for uh, studio time, for funding for mastering engineer, for album artwork, for that that kind of stuff. Like I can't. There are so many conventions, I will not, you know, approach my fans to just like fund me going to a convention, you know, yeah. uh, on occasion, I, you know, I've had fans, uh, sponsor, basically sponsor me at a convention. Uh, 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 origami Griffin actually, uh, put up the, uh, 
uh, the scratch to get me the hotel for FAU because FAU could not afford to, you know, fly me out there and put me up in the hotel. But if one of those was taken care of, then uh, then they could make it happen. And they, you know, they they've already been public about this. Usually, this is stuff that you don't mention unless you know they want it to be made public. But like they've already announced that kind of stuff on Twitter. So, mm -hmm. uh, like that's you know that's one of those things that first of all, uh, uh, it it makes me it it humbles me. <laughs> that people are willing to do that like that just blows my mind it makes me uh it makes it worth the the low paycheck and the long hours to keep making these these noises that i make and, and banging on the keys the way i do you mm -hmm. know to know that there are people who are willing to do that just to come see me at a show um mm -hmm. but i you know i can't i can't be constantly fundraising just to get to conventions over and over again because you will eventually wear your fans out doing that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Like nice. some people on Patreon. Yeah. Well, I mean, Patreon. Patreon's another thing. Like Patreon, uh, if you're doing Patreon right, you're you're releasing goods on a regular basis, uh, and providing access and/or exclusivity that is worth the money being paid. Yes. You know, yeah. or at least in the at least in the eyes of the patrons, they are they are putting forth what they feel is worth what they're getting back. It's not just begging for money. It's an ongoing relationship, and if you see it as anything other than an ongoing relationship, you're doing Patreon wrong. Yep. Yeah. Um, hmm. But if they're just like you know charging a monthly fee and their people are not getting anything, then yeah, you might as well just hold a GoFundMe and you know and beg. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I understand GoFundMe's for sing single projects, but yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, it, it, the whole thing about Patreon is you're you're supporting someone's career, someone's like development of whatever their art form is, or whatever they're like oh, exactly they're working on. So, hmm. I mean, well, that's the the beautiful thing about Patreon, is in, and you know, I don't want to say I invented Patreon, but I've been doing Patreon since 2008, uh, when I I created my own multi-tiered subscription site called called MatthewEbel.net. Um, mm -hmm. And then Patreon came along five years later, and I jumped on with that because I didn't want to do tech support anymore. I'd mm. rather just make music. Um, it was a kludge. I mean, MatthewHubel.net was five years of WordPress plus uh, A member, which are two like PHP scripts things that that interact with each other and kind of made it work mostly well enough, kind of maybe sorta. And people put up with that for five years, and then Patreon came along and like, yes, please, no, you make a system, and then you troubleshoot it. I'm gonna go over here and make music now. Yeah, um, <laughs> you will get your kit. Your like doing... cut. You will get your cut from it. Like I'm cool not to like not to have to. Absolutely, it's crowded. it's worth the five percent. It's worth the five percent cut or whatever it is for me not to have to answer text support emails and and maintain things like uh, and stay on top of things like credit card security and shit like that. Mm. Um, <laughs> But the like the the Patreon thing for ongoing projects, it means now because of that funding, I can send every single song that I'm releasing to a professional sound engineer. I don't have to just like do. If you listen to my 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 previous albums, a lot of them are self mixed, and you can really tell. And the last two albums I've I've released, well, the one that's going to be released on the 23rd. I've taken to a professional engineer, and they sound so much better, so much more legit, you know, like everything just locks in and and hits the speakers way better than than my efforts over the years. And it's because of Patreon, it's because of that constant income from people who believe in what I'm doing that I am able to budget for that. You know what I mean? Like Patreon is a, is a beautiful thing. It's not just begging for money, and it's not just uh, it's it yeah I mean it's it's not it's not just about you know you know paying artists because they're starving it's about making the music better it's about making the art better and if it if it isn't about that you're doing Patreon wrong yep uh, hold on uh oh all right your turn to host we lost <laughs> right. one sorry no I man I'm down about to sneeze <laughs> uh, I got gotcha. away I'm annoyed oh yeah when it just lingers there I love that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I got wow, one. Wow. Okay. So we. Mm -hmm. I got one. Go. Okay. So uh, where did the inspiration for like for Proto One and Proto Two and the whole like uh, Starship? Uh, what's it called like High Orbit? <laughs> yes, the High Orbit environment. All right. 
Where my, did all uh, that come from? My high orbit universe. Is it, is it like uh, some remember sort of... a million a million years ago at the beginning of this podcast? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I had mentioned the the wild west days of podcasting. Well, back in 2004 or 2005, uh, I started my own podcast. Uh, I did. Uh, I, I wanted to do a new music show because you know indie artists like myself were actually making their stuff available for musicians, and there were a lot of people that were just you know taking some songs from indie musicians, saying a few things about them. And playing them, and I'm like, I, there's got to be something better than this, something worth listening to, mm-hmm. you know? Because like, I'm I'm an entertainer. I'm I'm a music fan, obviously, but I'm also I'm an entertainer by heart. I want there to be more to it than that. Yep. And so I wanted to do uh, sort of like an MST3K kind of thing. Yeah. If you're familiar with Mystery Science Theater 3000, yep. like, only we're not not making fun of the music. Mm-hmm. You know. They're having fun with the music. But. Yeah, exactly. Like between the between songs, I I I I made a very clear decision at the beginning that I would only ever play my own music if it was for an album release, or if it was a, a live version that I had just gotten. You know, I just recorded. Okay. Um, otherwise, because I mean, playing my own music week after week after week, like who wants to listen to me jerk off? You know, to my own music week after week after week. <laughs> um, like that would just be nobody would want to listen to that. So I I. I made a point to try and support other indie artists with the show and at the same time do these fun things between the songs like at you know it's it basically I was playing a DJ somewhere in outer space who's just bored on his way from one gig to the next and just queuing up some music and playing it for other people out in space and my robots were just characters on the show that eventually developed into you know personalities of their own and People seem to like the robots way better than they liked Captain Evil. So I don't know how to take that. <laughs> but people really like Proto One a lot more than they like me. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and it just stuck with yeah. me, you know. I, it got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't keep doing the podcast every week, and then I just, I couldn't come up with stuff every month because, you know, it got to the point where I was writing full-on radio dramas. Mm-mm. And then it finally, it finally occurred to me in 2010 to do an episode as an album, and I'll do it as a Christmas album. Yeah. And people, people really dug that, you know. Yeah, and then there was one with the pandas. It's... Oh yes, High Orbit Saves the Pandas was a hell of a lot of fun. A hell of a lot of fun because again, it was I got to go into a real studio for that one, but also like it was, I don't know. I think that was some of my best comedy writing ever. <laughs> but I, it was just like it was, it didn't feel like work. It was a, it was just having a good yeah, time. You I was, know, I was just about it was to a ask lot you, of fun. Like, is there ever a point where you just like take a step back and say, how how is this my job? How am I getting paid to do this shit? Every every time I I get off stage at a convention, I ask that question like, "How the fuck is this what I do for a living?" Sometimes I say that in those words on the stage, you know. <laughs> it's great, like it's it's a, like and you, if you had asked me when I was you know in junior high, you know playing music, special music at my church and learning you know Rachmaninoff and stuff like that. Uh, like if you had told me this is what I'd be doing with my life, you know, in my 30s, like <laughs> I would, I wouldn't even, I'd, you know, I'd probably run away and tell an adult, you know, like it's, it's one of those things that like you can never see that kind of twist in your career coming, but you know, like I love this shit. It is work. It is a lot of work, especially like booking the shows, uh, uh, trying to get publicity, like doing all the the terrible stuff that record labels usually take care of or management usually takes care of. Like doing all that shit myself, that is work. Hmm. Sometimes writing lyrics is work, but man, actually getting to to perform this stuff on stage, like how how is this considered a job? <laughs> yeah, like I'm like doing the admin is probably the worst part of it, but like otherwise, it it just it just looks like you're having fun. So and that's yeah yeah that's all that everyone like and I don't know, I think people in general just get a lot of value out of any. <clears throat> Any creative person who has fun with what he does, and I mean, we wouldn't have Weird Al if he d- he wasn't having fun. And Weird Al is an inspiration for <laughs> oh, geez, so yeah. many people. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm 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 dabbling right now in uh, uh, dance music as well, because it's again trying to learn new things and and stretch myself. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I'm, I'm working on, you know, now that, now that the, the piano rock album, Cognitive Dissonance, is done being written, and it, it releases on the 23rd, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of working on the back burner, you know, just sending stuff to my Patreon folks. Yeah, focusing on the uh, work. Yeah, yeah, working and, and, and working on dance music because it's, it's something I've, I've dabbled in, you know, dipped a toe in that water, but I've never really, like, tried to see where I can go with it. So I'm just sort of experimenting with that for, like, whatever's going to happen for the next album in another year or two, you know? Mm. So, like, it's, it, you have to, God, as an artist, you have to be having fun. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. If I if I'm going to be miserable at my job, I'm at least going to go get a real day job and get paid more to be miserable. You know. Fair point. Yeah. Fair enough. Oh. Uh, I did, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm over here muttering to myself. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yo, we've got about ten minutes left. Um, any. Any words? I mean, you've been inspiring throughout the entire show, but I mean, like, is there anything you you really want to focus on uh, for you know the people who are listening? Obviously, also for the uh, YouTube um, things. What what are you? What would you sort of come up as your sort of final words to people, say from South Africa or Europe or anything like that? Uh, I'm sorry that we have an asshole president. <laughs> Good start. Yeah. Good start. Hopefully, those are my final words. You know, I don't see like black SUVs pulling up outside now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you are in a Skype call with an outside, possibly terrorist-linked country. Oh please. <laughs> it's it's weird actually. We always end up on politics anyway. Um, one of the things that um, <clears throat> there was a guy that I know on the Mac who I've always wanted to actually like speak to over a Skype and things like that. And he always constantly tells me, like, he's very, very afraid of, you know, talking about the things that he's done and, like, you know, talking about himself online, particularly because he's afraid that people are going to be listening to things like this. Yeah. I I don't know. I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, it, it it's said that you, whenever you're in polite company, you avoid politics and religion, you know. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Um I, I think that that time has, has come and gone. And the important thing is to, and again, this is, you know, this is a, a Christian value, and it should be displayed by more Christians, uh, is humility in all things. Uh, hmm. Talk about politics, talk about religion, but talk about it from a standpoint of, I'd like to get to know you better, not, this is why you're wrong. Yep. You know, and I think that we would all be a, a lot better off even with people you disagree with, if you understand where they're coming from. But so often the discussion ends, as it did with me and Counselor Troy, uh, dis the discussion ends with being smacked upside the head or, you know, <laughs> and, and, and somebody walking away angry. Um, hmm. uh, and that's a long story, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how much time you got for that one. But uh, uh, so, so often we... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. Like, so so often we we uh, we're afraid to dabble into talking about politics when it is so very important that we discuss what we think the solutions to our problems really are. And you know, and the more that you you focus on on the common goal of solving the problem, the the less likely you are to get divided into camps. Usually, I mean, all of these, all of our, all of our disagreements we have politically are over policy they're all over what it what it is you think we should practically be doing but the problem yeah. is it's difficult to get people fired up and and you know join rallies and and get all emotional about sensible solutions and so instead of saying you know we should you know, we, we spend more time with our neighbors and our communities and the people around us and and get to know them uh the, it's a lot easier to just say, you know, let's ban brown people from coming into our country. Mm. Uh, it's a lot easier just to say, you know, uh, the the gays are the reason why hurricanes keep it in Florida. You know, it's a lot easier to just come up with something emotional and reckless and put that on a poster and wave it around. And it's it's not productive. You look at something like uh, the issue of abortion in the states, and it is it's a very divisive topic that really shouldn't be because 
as far as I know, people who are pro-choice and people who are pro-life both want the same thing, which is fewer abortions. And they could both be working towards that goal, but they are not. You know, yeah. I don't know anybody who is pro-choice. It's like there should be more abortions. You know what? That should it should be like a pastime. We should just make that a hobby. Yeah. You know, like nobody nobody thinks that. Okay, nobody nobody of sound mind thinks that. You know, I'm sure that there are you know people who are you know into Nickelback who aren't all right in the head, uh, and there are probably some people out there who who maybe actually think that. But I'm talking about you know most most normal people. They they all want the same thing. They all want, you know, uh, uh, people to be happy. They all want their kids to grow up with clean drinking water. They want their their grandparents to be taken care of and comfortable until they eventually die of old age, you know, without dying in poverty. And we we all want these things for ourselves and ostensibly for other people. Mm. If we if we come at these problems. By discussing the policy, not by what we think is wrong with the other people. Yeah. Then maybe we can we can change the discourse away from, uh, away from the hype. Yeah, and maybe I mean, maybe there'll be less there'll be less terrorism because of it. You know, because we're having conversations, not screaming. Yep. Yeah. No, fair enough. I mean, it's 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 interesting, and I mean, like we can we can bring that into the furry fandom as well. In that, I mean, there's that whole thing that's happening with the Nazi furs and goodness knows what else happens there. Yeah. And it's it's literally it's it's actually it's it's very politically you know orientated. It's about how people see the world and uh, or like who is you know the loudest person at any given point. I mean like <clears throat> I still irrespective of, of views or anything like that, I still have a lot of respect for somebody like um uh to uh, to Griff to the ranting Griffin. Griffin. Yeah, to the ranting Griffin. Um, particularly because you know, I mean, he's he's voicing an opinion more than anything else. He's not trying to be Hitler. He's not no. trying to do this entire thing where he's literally like the very fact that we've begun to shut people down because of opinions that they hold. It's not even that they hold those opinions like super dearly to themselves. It's just, you know, I think this is possibly a solution kind of thing. It's not a solution that says I'm going to kill every single person who is like this because that's just stupid. And I know that somebody like, you know, to Griffin is not stupid. He's not yeah. incomprehensibly. But here's here's where as a person, yeah. here's where things like that break down, though, is the the, the problem, uh, especially Especially as somebody with a soapbox, you know, and I have a, a moderate soapbox of my own, uh, and you know, he, Lord knows that uh, uh, too does. Mm -hmm. uh, you inspire people to do things. One of the 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 greatest returns I ever get as an artist is not money for CDs, and it's it's uh, you know, it's not even you know free drinks or you know people throwing their underwear at me, whatever. Uh, it's when somebody shows me something and says, this is the artwork that I made based on this song lyric. Like, you inspired me to go and make something else. But it's a double-edged sword. You know, if I say something and it inspires someone to do something terrible, yeah. you know, I'm not legally responsible, but in a small way, I am responsible. Mm. And for what you say, and the, the, the whole saga with, with, with Two and Anthrocon, it seems to me that like it's as though the furry fandom is just now coming to the realization that yes, the things that you say actually do matter. Holy shit! Yeah. You you can't just you you can't just erase things and say that's not what I meant, and and everything will be okay. The yeah. things that actually come out of your mouth, the things that you actually type, do matter. And yeah. one thing that I had to learn growing up. Uh, uh, as a precocious, you know, somewhat sociopathic child, uh, was that it did not matter what my intentions were. It, didn't, it never mattered what I meant to say. All that ever mattered was how I was perceived. And I have been, I've been blessed by uh, crowds of people who, who, you know, friends of mine who have come to me after I've said something horrifically offensive or incredibly stupid or ignorant or, uh, you know, uninformed and have said to me, you know, quietly, like, okay, here's why what you just said 
was incredibly offensive and you know spelled it out for me because a lot of times I don't even know um, you know like it, it's one of those things where if you you know like Eddie Izzard once said you know, uh, 10% is what you say uh, 90% uh, 20% is, say. is or yeah, yeah you, you know the line it's like it's 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 how you look when you say it yeah, yeah. Matters the most. Like it's, it's how you're perceived uh, uh, that matters the most. And that's what can inspire people to actually go out and cause harm. And that, that's what I think people's problem is with, too. Now, I've met Matt Davis, also known as the Ranting Griffin. I've met Matt mm -hmm. Davis on multiple occasions. Um, the, the first time I really spent any time with him, he put me up in his suite at Anthrocon because he thought that, you know, I should be playing Anthrocon because he thought that the furry community needed to see my music. You know, he really, he was really helping me out. He was a perfect gentleman, a boy scout. He sent me home with a, a an 18 year old bottle of scotch for crying out loud, just like unopened, just like here, have this, take this back with you, you know, he was a, a perfect gentleman to me. Every time I've ever interacted with him, he's been absolutely fantastic. And I know that he is not a Nazi. You know, I, I know that he is not, I know that he is not personally somebody who wants you know, wishes harm on, on other people. But he also, like, his comedy is shock comedy, you know, just yeah. in, in the manner of George Carlin or, or you know, other, you know, shock-based shock comedians. And it's a very fine line between, uh, as Kathy Griffin just fucking found out, it's a very fine line between uh, comedy and, uh, 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 and insult. You know, it's a yeah. very fine line between between you know comedy and an affront to to sensibilities. Yeah. And I'm I mean, sorry, but you know, like the what the things that we say actually matter, and eventually you yeah. do have to to reap what you sow. And whether or not you intend yes. something, whether or not you intend something, it has to. It, it all that all that matters is that software transfer that we talked about at the beginning of the show. All that matters is how that other computer is receiving what you're putting out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, this is true. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's that fine line between being famous and using your soapbox for the right things or for the wrong things. Not knowing what the wrong things are sometimes plays into, I guess, other people's, I guess, perspectives. Yeah. Um, it's 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 a very very I mean like like you said it's, it's a very very fine line to be able to say something and sort of come off as a joke, or I mean like half the time you can text something and obviously people don't necessarily understand whether you're being sarcastic or yeah. something like which is one of the hate like I hate text media particularly <laughs> for that kind of reasons like what what am I supposed to do put in more stickers all yeah. the stickers I need stickers for every single goddamn emotion please and thank you. Yeah, you, you know, can say anything you want, just type LOL at the end, and it doesn't matter, right? That it, it, It's been proven time and again that LOL doesn't necessarily fix things. Nope. Uh, or JK, or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the, the, I'm sure that every, every single person who picked on me when I was in school thought that they were just kidding around and thought that they were just, you know, they didn't, nobody thinks of themselves as a, you know, a, a sadistic prick. But... Yeah. At the same time, they think they're just kidding around. They think they're just being funny, uh, and they are actually doing harm. And it's it's a question of you know being empathetic to how other people are going to receive the data that you're transmitting, and being completely deaf to to how most people are going to receive what you're saying will get you into trouble. And it's unfortunate, especially if you especially if you you, you like deep down, you're a good person. How good people become bad people? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Like the hell is paved with good intentions. Well, yeah, and it's also not it's it's not a, a one way street either. It's something that you can recover from. It's something you can come back from. But you have to be. You can't shut yourself off. You can't invalidate. Well, you're just not understanding what I'm saying. You can't just invalidate how other people are receiving you. Mm. You have to be. You know, it has to be a relationship with yeah. everyone. Yeah, you have to That's how bit, we live. Yeah, you have to be a little bit empathetic to whatever everyone else is going through. Otherwise, you yeah. Know, otherwise, that communication just breaks down. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, you're a sociopath, you know, which yeah. is, you know, something, something that can be fixed, something that can be dealt with, but you better be able to recognize it and go seek help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. 
Well, on that book, uh, I guess. That's, Leave that's out a deep the... philosophical note. <laughs> yeah, we no, believe me, we end on a lot of these bombshells. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for um, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we wish we had more questions uh, from yeah. the. And I mean, the thing is that we were since since we fixed everything, we've been live on uh, Fairy FM since then. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's no. yeah. We've, we've been live everywhere, <laughs> so we've lost about five percent of the conversation. But I mean, anyone who wants to catch up on that, starting like twenty minutes or so. Uh, this video is going up on YouTube pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All and right, we'll, well, cool. Pop you a link as well. Uh, yeah, no, we, we, we barely enjoy any kind of editing in our videos, particularly because it's this is how it is. This is how we <laughs> like talking. Yeah. It's, it's not like, I mean, like an opinion is an opinion, irrespective of whether things go down or anything like that. People will know that it happens, and yeah, people right. will know that we're human. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean context. So, is, context is important. We're not gonna just gonna yeah. cut that out with editing. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. So um, thank you again for for joining us. We would love to have you on again at some point if you're willing to to join us again. Yeah, Maybe. sounds like fun. Yeah. So yeah, thanks thanks again. We really really appreciate yeah, this your. This was an absolute pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure. Well, beautiful. I'm glad I could pleasure you for the last uh, 90 minutes. Um, that's uh, never mind. Let's you you say that's, you don't want to edit things out, but hey, there it is. That's that's how we like it. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping that one. Well, it's been my it, it's been my pleasure as well, and thank you thank you guys very much for uh, for uh, uh, having me on. Yeah. yeah. So final All plug: right. your album is dropping on the 23rd of June, correct? Yes, it is. And uh, if you want to hear it, I'm assuming you can just keep listening to this uh, podcast, but uh, you can also go and listen to the uh, the preview samples over at MatthewEbel.com uh, and MatthewEbel.com slash Cogdis for cognitive dissonance if you want to actually pre-order it. And uh, we'll have a listening party on the 23rd that you'll be able to tune into, hopefully without network drops. Yay! Yeah, well, yay! <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be playing like a couple of select songs off of the album as well. So for those of you who are listening uh, on Fairy.fm, I'm going to be dropping after In the Muck. Um, I'm going to be dropping a couple of the uh, songs between some of the other songs that I'll be playing. Maybe we'll kind of go whichever way the music takes, because um, I try to keep things at the same tempo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck so, with that. Yeah, well, look. I mean, if it's if it's if it's Foo Fighters esque, I'll just play Hailstorm and Foo Fighters all night long. Yeah, right. That'll work. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much again. Really, really right. appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. See Thank ya. you. Cheers, buddies. <laughs>